So here's what we were just talking about, um, and we're going to get into, like Dr. Georgia said, we're going to get into this more in the second half, which I guess is supposed to be starting pretty soon. Um, the loss of a normal or slightly upsloping alveolar plateau is an indication of an incomplete or obstructed exhalation. And then this is the shark fin. This is your COPD or asthmatic patient. So there's an obstruction, and the waveform shows that the exhalation is being slowed, usually because of bronchoconstriction. So you're going to see this in those type of patients. Um, the use of bronchodilators, which obviously we're going to use with our asthmatic or COPD ears, or tracheal suctioning, um, are often needed to correct this waveform. So obviously, you're looking at waveforms, but you're looking at your patient too, and I think that's the thing. We can get we can get all worried and tied up with waveforms with end tidal CO2, but how's your patient look? And you know, you can tell. Are they working hard to breathe? Are they slowing down? Are they slowing down because they're pooping out and they need to be intubated? Are they slowing down because you've now used your bronchodilators and they're getting better? So it's all about assessment too. This is an assessment tool that we use, but at the end of the day, we still gotta listen to rough sounds and do an assessment on our patient. So I don't want anyone to get you know, sometimes when you start going through different waveforms, you start getting a little, I know myself anyway, you start getting stressed like, okay, what does each thing mean? Am I gonna remember this at the moment? Go back to your assessment, because that's what's the most important thing. But this is a tool for you to use. Okay, elevation of the baseline. So what does that mean? Um, it means that there is incomplete inhalation and or exhalation. So the CO2 is not being completely washed out during inhalation. And this is often seen with air trapping in patients with a history of asthma or COPD. So the, L the baseline continues to elevate. Um, or if you, <coughs> sometimes with those kind of patients, if you're um, uh, using a BBM and you're not allowing them to exhale after each breath, you might see an elevated waveform, especially on those kind of patients who have um, Key. Yeah, and children too. Yes. Like we, air stacking is something mm -hmm. that uh, in critical care transport, we really got to look out for this because that can easily happen if you start assisting. Or even get somebody on a mechanical ventilator. Mm -hmm. uh, get air stacking and just keep blowing them up, blowing them mm -hmm. up. They're not having a chance to fully exhale and you'll end up with an thorax or other complications. So that's super important. <coughs> Granted, you're not doing using ventilators, but still your IE time is your inspiratory expiratory ratio, which we do. Even when you're ventilating a patient with a BVM, you're still have got a ratio going there. And when we have patients on ventilators, we have to watch that, and especially like Dr. Georgia with our pediatric population. So if you see this, you need to allow your patient to exhale and then go ahead and ventilate them again, and hopefully you can get your baseline down to something appropriate. That you don't want to see either. <laughs> Sudden loss of a waveform. And um, this happened to me on um, the transport. We were, um, and this is why we talk so much about checking your patient before you move and after you move. So when we're doing a transport, of course it's code three, and everybody wants you out the door in two seconds. And so the patient's intubated. We moved the patient over to the gurney. The patient was on the ventilator at the hospital. Um, I had already put the patient on in tile <clears throat> on our monitor. We moved the patient and then I switched out the vent and to put the patient on our ventilator. Got the patient on our ventilator, the in tile CO2 had been 37, 38, and I had a 99% pull, um, pull flux in the tree, so I was happy. We moved the patient, it's, um, and of course the monitor is at the front of the gurney, so I asked the medic, okay, what's my in tile? And he goes, zero. And I thought it can't be zero. Like we just had a 38, you know, end title. And I go check it again. He goes, Lori, it's still zero. I go, is it dash dash dash? Because dash 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 is usually like, you know, we have a malfunction of the end title CO2. And he goes, no, it's just flat line and it's zero. I'm like, well, okay. So we took him off. <laughs> this is not good. We're not going anywhere. So I took him off our ventilator and started bagging the patient, and immediately we got um we got an end title in the 20s and it just went up to 35. And this is all you know, obviously within you know, 30, 45 seconds. But what was happening was I had a malfunction of my ventilator. It was not working. Because I looked and I had no chest rise and the ventilator wasn't doing its job. So 
But the pulse oximetry still read 98% the whole time we were doing this. So it just Which shows it wasn't. What? <laughs> <laughs> it was the auto It wasn't our new one. I was going to say, because I don't like the old one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it was malfunctioning. So, so anyway, um, <laughs> yeah. But it was, just, it was just a clear example of how quickly your entitled CO2 goes to zero and your pulse oximetry continues to look fine. So if I had just been basing this off my pulse oximetry, I would have really been in a bad place when I got them into the ambulance, because by then, I would have been a couple minutes behind in what I should be doing. So we fixed the problem, and the patient did just fine, if you wanted to know, on their way to scare this stuff. So. <laughs> but if you see that, you better check real quickly. Is your tube out? I mean, go through your dope mnemonic, because it's just an equipment problem, because it could be. Um, are they obstructed? Whatever, but most of the time it's be probably because you have an equipment problem like I did or your tube's out. So apnea, or if they're breathing, you've got they are now apneic. And obstruction, is it dislodged? Airway disconnection, ventilator malfunction, or worse yet, cardiac arrest. So. <clears throat> What's your dope mnemonic? Did you say dope? Dope. dope. Yeah. Dislodged, yeah. obstruction, pneumo, or equipment failure. Equipment failure. For a reason too. Sorry, that's like the little thing in my. I don't use pneumonics very often, but that's one I remember because every time I have an intubated patient, that's the one I go through in my head immediately. So it's one of those. Was it a PALS one? I think we use yeah, the PALS, PALS a lot. PALS. Yeah. So it's a good one to remember because it just gives you a really good, it's just a good tool so you can go through if you have a patient. So review, since it's Dr. Giorgio's turn to put this all together with um, different scenarios. It's the only 100% reliable tool for determining ET placement. CPR is necessary to generate a waveform. Monitor the waveform and the value. Use both as tool. Trending is important. Remember to document your entitled CO2 so those numbers go up next time we ever talk about this that Jess shared. And it's mandatory now, so we need to make sure we document our entitled CO2 on our PCL, <coughs> make a strip, check your tube before and after, and document your entitled CO2s before and after you move your patient. That way, in court later on, they're not gonna say, well, that tube wasn't in. You're like, look, when I gave care, this was my entitled CO2 on that patient. And it's documented, and you have a waveform to prove it. <coughs> 